Hey guys, this is Rick. So I said in the last video that I'd come back to this argument about you can't possibly increase the block size limit indefinitely. That's just kicking the can down the road. And you know, we've all heard this scaling debate arguments for years and years and years. And participating in any kind of scaling debate is just short of more pleasant than having your eyes poked out by now. But I'd still want to address the argument. I want to counter the argument and say specifically what specifically why this narrative, this line of narrative is not correct. <laughs> So let's look at increasing the block size limit indefinitely. You know, there is this Bitcoin BTC narrative. This doesn't exist on, in Bitcoin BCH, but in Bitcoin BTC, in that fork, that the narrative goes something like this. You cannot possibly increase the block size limit. Because yes, there is a problem with block sizes. Everybody knows that. But increasing the block size limit is only kicking the can down the road a little bit. And you'd run into the same problem again sooner or later. So you'd essentially have to increase the block size limit indefinitely. And at this point, the listener is supposed to realize how silly this sounds and realize that solving the problem by increasing the block size limit is supposed to be the wrong solution to the problem. It is not the wrong solution for the, to the problem. It is completely mathematically sound, and I'm going to show why. But first, a quick background. Uh, Satoshi Nakamoto capped the Bitcoin block size limit at one megabyte. It wasn't even commented. It was a part, as a part of a random other commit. And this was done at a time when one megabyte blocks was roughly 100 times the utilization of the network at the time. This was not a spam protection. This was not a spam protection. It was a denial of service attack protection. It was a protection against a miner creating an enormous block maliciously, putting that out on the network and essentially bogging down all of the other miners in trying to validate this block while the malicious miner got a head start and mined a number of blocks while the other were busy processing this poison block. It was a protection against this kind of denial of service. But you'll notice that when the utilization starts to creep up toward this limit that was set, as it approaches, as it approaches the limit, this limit is not a denial of service protection. Instead, it becomes a denial of service attack vector because it becomes incredibly cheap to congest the network. And once the network is running at capacity or utilization is above capacity, the entire service becomes congested and usage is denied. Service is denied. Denial of service has happened. Satoshi suggested as one part of many of the other things he wrote that the block size limit could be raised at about block 115,000. <laughs> that was a while ago. We're now at block approximately 530,000. And that block size limit has still not been lifted on the BTC fork of Bitcoin. So that's the background. So then, why isn't the cap lifted? to be at about 100 times the current utilization. I made another video that goes into depth while this has not happened. And it describes why the company Blockstream failed when it tried to be a vertical and a horizontal in the marketplace at the same time. 
and therefore failed miserably at both. Being a vertical is not a problem. Being a horizontal is not a problem. If you're, go if you're trying for both, you're going to fail, which Blockstream did. And there was constant goal shifting with the narratives just to justify Blockstream's interests at the time. And this was one of those, one of those narratives. And I'd like to address this specifically. When somebody says you can increase the block size limit because you'd have to keep increasing it indefinitely, a proper response is that yes, and it is perfectly mathematically sound to do so. It works because Bitcoin scales linearly with usage. Utilization of resources follows a beautiful line like this with, with usage. But all the resources that Bitcoin uses are growing exponentially. All the resources used are growing like this. Therefore, therefore, as long as Bitcoin scales linearly on top of an exponentially growing resource pool, then it is capable of growing exponentially without any problems with mathematical certainty. The specific layers underneath would be processor muscle. We've all heard of Moore's law, the, which basically says that the number of transactions transistors, not transactions, the number of transistors in a processor roughly doubles every 18 months. Approximation as it may be, this is the last 120 years of processor muscle, making a very nice flat line on a logarithmic scale. This is from um, a think tank called Move Forward, credit where credit is due. So for the past 120 years, this has held solid. Storage. Some uh, watching this may have been around in the era of 615 slash four hard drives. If you remember them, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Even before 615 slash four hard drives, there were things like this. The 10 megabyte hard drive for just $3,398. It's a steal, folks. Come and get it while it's hot. Things have improved ever so slightly since. I think this is what you get a 10 terabyte RAID archive for today. No, wait. A 10 terabyte disk is about... $300, $400. So this is what you're getting a roughly 100 terabyte archive for, if you don't make specialized solutions. Some exponential growth there, quite some exponential growth. Bandwidth, bandwidth. From Wikipedia, we find this lovely picture, US Robotics Courier Modem, which had the fascinating ability that when it dialed another modem over the phone lines and it detected a US robotics courier in the other end, it went into magic mode and gave you as much as 33.6 kilobits per second. And it was amazing. Things change. Things change. My first modem was a 1200 kilobit, 1.2 kilobit per second, not 1200, 1.2 kilobit per second. And then I got fiber in 1999 and things were never the same after that. And last but not least, memory, memory. The first computer I had had three kilobytes of random access memory 
a large chunk of which went to the screen buffer. My workstation today has 64 gigabytes. So yeah, there's some difference. Some things have happened. All of these four resources are going exponential. All of them are going exponential. And therefore, and therefore, any service that scales linearly on top of this, on top of this, will scale exponentially for free. Therefore, it is completely mathematically sound to plan for increasing the block size limit indefinitely. There's also some quotes from early years of Bitcoin. One, one frequently quoted is Satoshi Nakamoto himself in 2010 said that Bitcoin can do much better than this, referring to visa level transaction volume in the previous sentence, with existing hardware for a fraction of the cost. It never really hits a scale ceiling, he wrote. Other the research, for example, by Peter Risen, I hope I pronounced that right, has observed that the Bitcoin Core software, Bitcoin Core here reserve, refers to the software, actually has a lot of bottlenecks. Not in the protocol, not in the infrastructure, but in the implementation and the code. There's a lot of bottlenecks that, frankly, shouldn't be there. And according to Peter Risen's research, one of his slides, he states that a Bitcoin node could probably he says, probably, there's always some uncertainty until it's proven, but it gives us a ballpark, ballpark figure, which is useful here, can probably achieve visa, le visa level with a four core computer running with 16 gigabytes of memory. That gives you an idea that we're already pretty much where a home computer on a home connection can run, can run a full-fledged Bitcoin system, as in a full node. Other research says that we'll get there for today's laptop budget by 2029, which is also fine, I want to hammer home, because scaling exponentially, if we're getting to where a laptop can process the entire network in about 10 years, then we're just fine. We're just fine. Then again, of course, if you're running on a home connection, then you should not be running a full node in the first place, as we observed in, in the last video. What you should be running if you want to verify transactions is something called SPV, which also was also designed by Satoshi Nakamoto and even outlined in the original white paper called Simplified Payment Verification. What this means is that you download a few kilobytes per megabyte, megabyte of data. I think I saw a number 12 kilobytes, something like that, very small amount, which contains cryptographic signatures so that you can verify any part of the block you like. And then you ask the network for the parts you would like to verify, typically the ones going to your addresses. Since Every node, including these SPV nodes, are constantly regarding the longest chain as the valid one. Then the cost of cheating an SPV node is just as high as constructing the longest chain, as in you require a 51% attack, which would put the entire network out of order anyway. There's no difference between an SPV node and a so-called full non-mining node in terms of whether they can verify data more or less. So, summarizing, planning for an indefinite increase, an infinite increase I write here, I see, but indefinite increase in the block size limit 
is completely mathematically sound. Is completely mathematically sound. As long as you expect the underlying resources, processor muscle, storage, bandwidth, and memory to keep increasing as they have done over the past roughly 120 years and with all the new thing, new exciting technologies that are ever more resource hungry unless you see one of these coming to an abrupt halt around the corner which i absolutely don't then planning for an indefinite increase in the block size limit is as sound as planning for an indefinite gradual increase in these four resources. In the next video, we're going to tackle another of the Bitcoin BTC forks narratives. How will the miners get paid? And this is as frustrating a question to me as when I'm talking about the nonsense of the copyright monopoly and somebody argues, but how will the artists get paid? It's the exact same kind of nonsense. And we'll come back to that in the next video.